Think, of course, about the main risks and the common obstacles when we implement the plan. They are, of course, uh, related uh, to the success factors that we have been mentioning, not only just now, but throughout the three sessions, okay? So they can be, um, as we saw, either internal factors or maybe linked to some external factors. But either way, um, of course, it's not always going to be in our hands to eliminate them, but we need to foresee them and uh, that way we can think about some mitigation measures, okay? So what are these main risks? Okay, first, we have been talking about this throughout the three sessions, okay, throughout the whole training. The lack of support from the top leadership is one of our major risks here, okay? Especially when um, gender equality plan are still in an early stage of the implementation, um, <clears throat> because this will totally impact on the institutionalization uh, that we need. And here the lack of leader leadership support will totally undermine the legitimacy of the process and the relevance of the gender equality plan. Okay, so this is one of our main risks. The second one would be lack of funding, also something that we have been talking about, the absence of dedicated and adequate resources, which will lead to normally we, we place responsibility of the JEPS implementation only in one unit, which will probably be ill-equipped. It will be one or two people with no funds, with little or no autonomy. So it will totally prevent a successful implementation here, okay? Um, and of course it will prevent as well the proper institutionalization and sustainability of the actions, okay? And that is totally linked with the next risk, which is lack of institutionalization. And this, this has to do with how the gender equality plan is embedded in the organizational procedure, which is something that we said is a key aspect. So if we don't embed the, the actions properly within the institution, then we will have a lack of institutionalization, okay? And uh, many times this has to do with the adoption of short-term measures that, has, that have no long-term impact and that have no operational um, perspective within the processes of the institution, okay? So there is two principles linked to this risk. One is inclusiveness and the other one is participation, as you were mentioning at the beginning, as it's a key aspect, okay, at the beginning of the session. So proper adoption of these principles are key to secure institutionalization. Then another risk, again, of course, resistances. But we need to differentiate here two different uh, type of resistances. We can, on the one hand, face resistances at the intermediate level. And this is uh, people and staff who do not consider the promotion of gender equality as a priority for them or for their work, or that that uh, directly deny gender inequalities, or the need to work on gender equality, or they deny gender biases, and therefore they will be agents that will be directly antagonizing institutional change. Okay, in this type of resistances, they are faced by the implementing uh, team or structure. They will be faced on a daily basis by all our gender equality advocates and activists and the implementation team, okay? And then we need to differentiate them for these other type of resistances, which are organizational resistances due to gender-blind bureaucracy and the gender-blind processes of our institution. This, we're talking about these long established procedures and these ways of doing things. I'm sure that you have all heard this, this is the way that things are done here, right? Does it sound familiar to you? So um, I would like to bring here, there is this um, feminist activist and this gender ex expert from Zambia, Sarah Longwe, and she explains very good um, what is beneath 
uh, this this resistance. Okay, it's, and she talked about how uh, organizational culture has two different forms, and that would be like the overt and the covert one. So the first one would be this organizational bureaucracy and procedures, like the formal procedures of the organization. Okay, it's like the overt um, organizational culture, and the second is what she calls the covert patriarchy. So she says, bureaucratic principles demand implementation, but patriarchal principles demand evaporation. So we need to think how they are intertwined together and how these patriarchal, these covert uh, patriarchal principles will subvert bureaucracy. So the same thing, the same way as we cannot say that science and that knowledge production is gender neutral, we cannot treat bureaucracy as if it was gender neutral, as if it was politically neutral, okay? Because it plays a major role in the maintenance of, of uh, patriarchy in our institutions, okay? So this is an interesting risk. I will, I will give you the reference to this Sarah Longway article, okay? In case you're interested in that. And then the gendered character of um, scientific culture this is what we are talking about here is this persistence of this male-centered scientific culture that we were talking in the, in the, during the first session and this remains um, one of the main risks um, because this um, this constitutes like the main or the core talent to gender mainstreaming in research because this is challenging this fundamental premise of of scientific neutrality. Uh, so challenging this, um, and if, if our institution has like a very entrenched and, and a strong gender uh, character of scientific culture, this will be a, a risk for implementation, okay? And then a uh, strong competitive and meritocratic culture which many times come along with the existence of more vertical or hierarchical structures, because this can avoid the implementation of some um, structural measures like positive actions. And um, yeah, this culture makes this kind of initiative to be perceived as against the scientific excellence uh, concept and this uh, culture of promotion of merit alone. So this is also a risk. And um, the last one would be the lack of institutional or organizational authority. And there are two sides of, of, of this. The first one would be regarding like, the formal position of the gender unit within the structure and the level of authority of our gender unit within the, um, yeah, the whole organigram structure of our institution and its level of power and of influence. So the closer, closer structures would be situated on the top of the organization <clears throat> and they would, for example, report directly, <clears throat> sorry, to the rector or to the dean. And of course, the more <clears throat> authority the structure can have, the more effective the implementation will be. <clears throat> but the other side, sorry, <clears throat> The other side has to do with a more intangible aspect of authority and a more intangible side of power. And it will relate to the, to the epistemic authority of gender experts in our institution and the epistemic authority uh, of women in general in our organization. Okay, so two, two interesting sides of this. Of course, this is not a closed list depending on the context and depending on the organizational culture of your institution, you can face some other obstacles and risks. So you will need to think about them and to identify them, to be able to, to think about proper mitigation.